Sir James Dewar, the 20th of September 1842 to the 27th of March 1923, was a Scottish chemist and physicist. He's best known for his invention of the flask, which he employed in conjunction with research into the liquefaction of gases. He also studied atomic and molecular spectroscopy, working in these fields for over 25 years. Early life: James Dewar was born in Kincardine, Perthshire, in 1842, the youngest of six boys of Anne Dewar and Thomas Dewar, a vintner. He was educated at Kincardine Parish School, so Dollar Academy. His parents died when he was 15. He attended the University of Edinburgh, where he studied chemistry under Leon Playfair, later Baron Playfair, becoming Playfair's personal assistant. Dewar also studied under August Kakule at Ghent. In 1875, Dewar was elected Jacksonian Professor of Natural Experimental Philosophy at the University of Cambridge, becoming a Fellow of Peterhouse. He became a member of the Royal Institution and later, in 1877, replaced Dr. John Hall Gladstone within the role of Fullerian Professor of Chemistry. Dewar was also the president of the Chemical Society in 1897, and also Brit's Association for the Advancement of Science in 1902. Similarly, as serving on the Royal Commission established to appear at London's installation from 1893 to 1894, and thus the Committee on Explosives. While serving on the Committee on Explosives, he and Frederick Augustus Abel developed cordite, a smokeless gunpowder alternative. In 1867, Dewar described several chemical formulas for benzene. One of the formulae, which does not represent benzene correctly and wasn't advocated by Dewar, is typically still called Dewar benzene. In 1869, he was elected a fellow of the Academy of Edinburgh. His proposer being his former mentor, Leon Playfair. His scientific work covers an outsized field. His earlier papers cover topics including chemistry, hydrogen and its physical constants, high temperature research, the temperature of the sun and of the electrical spark, spectrophotometry, and also the chemistry of the electrical arc. With Professor J. G. McKendrick of the University of Glasgow, he investigated the physiological action of sunshine and examined the changes that happen within the electrical condition of the retina under its influence. With Professor G. D. Living, one all told his colleagues at the University of Cambridge, he began in 1878 a protracted series of spectroscopic observations, the later of which were dedicated to the spectroscopic examination of assorted gaseous elements separated from atmospheric air by the assistance of low temperatures. He was joined by Professor J. A. Fleming of University College London. Within the investigation of the electrical behavior of medication cooled to very low temperatures, James Dewar within the Royal Institution in London around 1900. His name is most generally known in relation to his work on the liquefaction of the so-called permanent gases and his researches at temperatures approaching temperature. His interest during this branch of physics and chemistry dates back a minimum of as far as 1874. When he discussed the latent heat of liquid gases before a people association, in 1878 he devoted a Friday evening lecture at the Royal Institution to the then recent work of Louis Paul Caillet and Raoul Pictet, and exhibited for the first time in Great Britain the working of the Caillet apparatus. Six years later, again at the Royal Institution. He described the researches of Zygmunt Florentie Rybleski and Karol Olszewski, and illustrated for the first time publicly the liquefaction of oxygen in air. Soon afterward, he built a machine from which the liquefied gas could also be drawn off through a valve to be used as a cooling agent. Before using the O in research work related to meteorites, about the identical time, he also obtained oxygen within the solid state. By 1891, he had designed and built at the Royal Institution machinery which yielded oxygen in industrial quantities. And towards the tip of that year, he showed that both oxygen and liquid ozone are strongly attracted by a magnet. About 1892, 
The thought occurred to him of using vacuum jacketed vessels for the storage of liquid gases. The Dewar flask, otherwise named as a thermos or vacuum flask, the invention that he became most famous. The vacuum flask was so efficient at keeping heat out, it absolutely was found possible to preserve the liquids for comparatively long periods, making an examination of their optical properties possible. Dewar didn't enjoy the widespread adoption of his flask. He lost a court case against Thermos concerning the patent for his invention. While Dewar was recognized because the inventor, because he didn't patent his invention, there was no due to prevent Thermos from using his design. He next experimented with a high pressure hydrogen jet by which low temperatures were realized through the Joule Thomson effect. And thus, the successful results he obtained led him to form at the Royal Institution an oversized regenerative cooling refrigerating machine. Using this machine in 1898, liquid hydrogen was collected for the first time, solid hydrogen following in 1899. He tried to liquefy the last remaining gas, helium, which condenses into a liquid at minus 268.9 degrees Celsius. But thanks to form of things, including a short supply of helium, Dewar was preceded by Heike Kamerling Onnes because the person to provide liquid helium in 1908. Onnes would later be awarded the laurels in physics for his research into the properties of matter at low temperatures. Dewar was nominated several times, but never succeeded in winning the accolade. In 1905, He began to research the gas absorbing powers of charcoal when cooled to low temperatures and applied his research to the creation of high vacuum, which was used for further experiments in physics. Dewar continued his research work into the properties of elements at low temperatures, specifically low temperature calorimetry, until the outbreak of War I. The Royal Institution Laboratories lost form of staff to the war effort. Both in fighting and scientific roles, and after the war, Dewar had little interest in restarting the extraordinary research work that went on before the war. Shortages of scholars necessarily compounded the problems. His research during and after the war mainly involved investigating natural phenomena in soap bubbles, rather than further work into the properties of matter at low temperatures. Family he married Helen Rose Banks in 1871. That they'd no children. Helen was sister in law to both Charles Dixon, Lord Dixon, and James Douglas Hamilton Dixon. His nephew, Dr. Thomas William Dewar, 1861 to 1931, was an amateur artist who painted a portrait of Sir James Dewar. He's presumably also the identical Thomas William Dewar as mentioned as executor in James Dewar's will, ultimately replaced, unopposed, by Dewar's wife. Honors and awards Whilst Dewar was never recognized by the Swedish Academy, he was recognized by many other institutions both before and after his death, in Britain and overseas. The Royal Society of London for Improving Natural Knowledge elected him a Fellow of the Honorary Society in June 1877 and bestowed their Rumford, 1894, Davy, 1909, and Copley Medal, 1916, medals upon him for his work, likewise as inviting him to deliver their Bakerian lecture in 1901. In 1899, He became the first recipient of the Hodgkin's Palm of the Smithsonian Institution, Washington, D.C., for his contributions to knowledge of the character and properties of atmospheric air. In 1904, he was the first British subject to receive the Lavoisier Medal of the Establishment of Sciences, and in 1906, he was the first to be awarded the Matucci Medal of the Italian Society of Sciences. He was knighted in 1904 and awarded the Gunning Victoria Jubilee Prize for 1900 to 1904 by the Academy of Edinburgh, and in 1908, he was awarded the Albert Medal of the Society of Arts. A crater was named in his honour. A street within the King's Buildings complex of the University of Edinburgh was named in memory of Dewar within the first 21st century.
Later life Dewar died on 27 March 1923 aged 80 and was cremated at Golders Green Crematorium in London. An urn along with his ashes still resides there.